Hi everyone, my name is Jules Turpak. Predominantly on TikTok and Twitter, I cover digital culture, which I consider to be anything that falls under human-computer interaction. And what first got me into this topic a few years ago was my interest in how education and work culture are changing because of technology. So I'm really, really happy to be here today and thank you so much for joining us. As many of you are aware, the United States is facing a nationwide educator shortage. School districts everywhere are hiring nurses, counselors, specialists, teachers, administrators, and more. So today we're here to turn that around and inspire you to consider a career in education because it's managed to become more important than ever before considering the information overload that kids experience all the time in their free time today. And speaking of online, we have some ama amazing educators on the panel today that actually balance education both in the classroom and on online platforms like social media, because the role of educators is vital everywhere and there is so much, op so much opportunity today. We're going to spend 45 minutes in discussion amongst the panel, and then we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. You can submit your questions through the Q&A function towards the bottom, I believe, on your screen. So now, before I introduce our panelists, we want to share some brief remarks from First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, who, while she couldn't be here live with us today, she wanted to share a few words of inspiration for this event. So we're going to roll that clip. Welcome, everyone. Some of you are joining us because you're interested in taking the first step towards working in education. And some are joining us from journeys already begun. But as a teacher myself for more than 30 years, I know that there is one thing that makes educators unique. We hear a call and we answer it. We answer because we are learners, never satisfied, always curious about our world and the people in it. We are sculptors, able to see the beauty hidden beneath the surface and help bring it out of hiding. We are explorers, collecting all of the wisdom and art and insight that humanity has to offer. And we are optimists, believing that when we give those things to the next generation, they will make our world a better place. Being an educator isn't just a job, it's who we are. To those who feel this calling but are still on the fence, let me say this. Answer that call. Become an educator. And when you do, you'll find a profession that brings you joy and meaning. You'll know that someone out there is a better thinker because of you. That someone is sitting a little taller because you gave him confidence. Someone is working a little harder because you pushed her to try. Someone is braver because you helped him find his courage. Join us and we will change the world together, one student at a time. Thank you. Truly a great person to speak to this. So thank you to Dr. Biden. And now I'm excited to get into our discussion. So panelists, let's get into some brief introductions. Let's have you share your name, what you do, and any other fact about yourself that you wanna put out there. Lauren, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Lauren Woolley. Um, I'm a fifth grade teacher in Northeast Ohio. Um, I actually started on social media a little over two years ago. So this is just something that kind of like fell into my lap and it has really truly changed my career. Um, I, I love what I do. I love being in the classroom with students and it is such a joy for me every day to get to make a difference in somebody's life. Um, I am on multiple committees at my school. I am on our leadership team. I'm on our national networks of par partnership schools team. Um, and I just kind of try to help to make the place a better place to come every day. Um, so uh, my fun fact, my little fun fact is that when I was in high school, I was a state finalist in speech and debate. Amazing. Thanks, Lauren. And now let's do Trayvon. Good afternoon. I'm Trayvon Thompson. I am currently a kindergarten teacher based in Los Angeles, and I've been teaching. This is actually my second year, so I haven't been doing it as long as some folks, but I do enjoy it very much, and I'm glad that I can make an impact on a student's life. A little fun fact about me is I used to be a dancer. I don't dance anymore because my knees are all messed up. The pandemic really helped my knees, but 
I don't dance anymore. You know, I'm just so happy. I don't feel pain in my knees every morning. So all dances out there, just be warned. I love that. Amber, you're up. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Shields. Um, I am a I've been in education for 11 years. The last four years I've served as principal at an early childhood center located in Dallas, Texas. Um, I love what I do. I love having an opportunity to support teachers as well as families. A fun fact about me is I actually am principal at the school I attended as an elementary school student. So I definitely get deja vu. I'm like, oh, this was Miss So-and-so's classroom, but I definitely enjoy being back there. And Dr. Maria. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Murillo. I am with a, a nonprofit called the Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, um, the also known as Branch Ed. Uh, Branch Ed is the only nonprofit in the country that works with teacher preparation programs, specifically at minority serving institutions, so HBCUs, HSIs, uh, institutions that serve diverse communities or diverse students. And we work alongside them to um, enhance the outcomes of their teacher preparation program and enhance the outcomes uh, within the communities and schools that they serve. Uh, so thank you for having me tonight. Looking forward to the discussion. Me too. Okay, the first topic we're getting into is setting the stage of a day in the life. So the first questions for Amber, Trayvon, and Lauren, Dr. Maria, we have a follow up for you right after, but you all work in different areas of education, as we just heard from each of you. Can you describe a day in the life in your current role? Um, anyone who wants to go first? go first so as i'm a campus principal in a very large urban school district we have over 150 elementary schools within my district um, so a day in the life is a little bit of operations and a little bit of instruction as well i shouldn't say a little bit a lot of bit of instruction um, so beginning of course i support with arrival and dismissal um, and those are some of the operational things that i do within the day cafeteria duty but also supporting with purchasing and managing our campus's budget to ensure like teachers have the resources that they need the copy paper, the expo markers, all of those things that we use a lot of in elementary schools, making sure they have what they need to be successful. Um, the instructional part of my role involves going into classrooms, doing observation, giving feedback, uh, supporting our teacher leaders as they lead professional learning communities for their grade level teams, and also continuing to grow myself as a leader. And um, I'm still very young as an educator, so I have a lot to learn. And that's one of the biggest things that I think my staff appreciates about me, just the humility that I bring. So I also try to plug in professional development for myself um, in my days or throughout the week. Thank you for the insight. That was awesome. Lauren or Trayvon, do you have anything to add there about your role? Yes, I do. So I'm a kindergartner, kindergarten teacher based in Los Angeles. So very diverse, very rich culture. And a lot of what goes on in my day includes planning, managing classes. We're doing assessments right now. So these next couple of weeks are gonna be very busy for me. I have a lot of meetings as well. So what you do as a teacher is not always a one dimensional thing. Like there's always something to do, always. Thank you, and Lauren? Yeah, um, every day is different. Every day is a variety of things. Um, I just switched from, I, I've taught fifth grade the past four years, but the past two years we went to self-contained. So me having to you know, continue my own learning, learning how to teach subjects that I wasn't previously teaching, um, that's something I'm constantly doing. Um, we're doing co-planning. Um, I have a new partner this year. So trying to kind of orient her and help her to kind of um, get on board and um, to learn our curriculums and different things like that. And then even just today, I had like two different meetings I had to attend with our grade level team and our principal. And then also with my um, NNPS team where we're planning events for the school and for families to attend and to have volunteers come in and be a part of our school community. So Every day is is very different. And I think that's what I love most about teaching is that it's not like a stagnant job where you're just sitting all day. Thank you for that insight. Dr. Mario, a different question for you. You've worked in so many different areas of education, whether that be in the classroom or as a department chair. Can you share what stands out to you as some of the biggest takeaways for, especially for newcomers who are on this call throughout that journey that you've had? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I would say that I hear a lot of my experience and the experience of uh, my other um, colleagues on the line. Uh, you know, the day in the life of an educator is very different every day. But like Lauren said, that's the the fun part of it. Uh, you never know what to expect. And you also get to dip, you know, your toes into a lot of different uh, types of work. And so um, that has been um, my experience as well. So uh, prior to working in nonprofit, uh, I worked, um, I'm in the Chicago area. Um, I worked for 20 years in public schools before moving into this role. Uh, and I worked as a classroom teacher, mostly at the high school level. I taught Spanish and English. I was a department chair and I was a high school administrator as well for several years. And I would say that the biggest takeaway, and that's a big question, by the way, thank you for it. Uh, I would say the biggest takeaway for me is to always, 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 always come back to the students. Uh, when you have a tough decision to make, uh, when you're deciding on classroom materials, whether it's a big decision or a small decision, when you center the well being, the joy, and the needs of your students, uh, you're going to go really far. So I would say that's one of the takeaways. I love that. Now we're gonna get into a topic about career inspiration. So we're gonna start with Trayvon. Can you talk a bit about what initially compelled you to be curious about education and then what ultimately, ultimately can't say that word today, made you decide what, uh, what this was the right path for you? Yeah, so. It goes back to my eighth grade history class. I had a really good history teacher. He always came in smiling, happy. You know, he always cared for his students. He would always check in and say, hey, is everything okay? I noticed this, is everything all right? I saw you doing this. So just seeing him and how compelled he was and how caring he was, that first inspired me to become a teacher. And what really put me on the path of being a teacher was I started tutoring at this charter school and to see the impact I was making, to see those light bulb aha moments from my students, it just really, it was like a calling for me. Amazing. And Lauren, you teach fifth graders. How did you decide which grade level was right for you? I find that really, really interesting and a big decision, of course. And aside from figuring out which grade level is right for you, um, do you maybe have some generalizations about the differing age groups for others to assess which could be right for them? Oh yeah. So when I was a senior in high school, like I didn't even want to be a teacher. Like this wasn't my career goal at, at one point in my life. Like, it wasn't like my calling at first. Um, but I kind of stumbled into education um, because of, I, I had other teachers that I really enjoyed. And um, I kept going back and forth between teaching high school English and teaching elementary school. And then I went to job shadow my kindergarten teacher from you know, the elementary school I had attended and I just fell in love with it. And I just thought, you know, how fun this must be to like work with little kids every day, but that's not for everybody. And I know that. And, um, like I teach fifth grade, but I didn't choose fifth grade. I used to think fifth graders were big kids. And like, I started out in second grade. So, um, my second graders were like my teeny little kids to me, but I knew like kindergarten and preschool was too little for me. <laughs> so, um, I kind of ended up in fifth grade because that was the position open at the school I was applying for. And um, I took it and I absolutely love it. I love their sarcasm. I love being able to crack jokes with them. They're self-sufficient, but they're still little kids. So like, it, it's kind of like the best of both worlds for me. Um, so that's how I decided on the, on the grade level that I'm in currently. But I think job shadowing is such an easy way to determine whether or not a grade level or a grade band would be good for you. Because I mean, it's easy to say, oh, well, I've been to high school. I know what high school is like, but actually going and job shadowing a high school teacher for a whole day and seeing what their day is like, or job shadowing an elementary teacher or a middle school teacher and really getting a feel for that career um, is very helpful when you're trying to determine what grade band. Yeah, completely agree. Nothing can replace the actual experience of it all. Amber, as a principal, you have visibility into a lot of areas of the school. For those with a college degree, maybe it is in child development, um, who want to work within the education environment, but don't necessarily want to be like an edu in an educator role, um, what kind of opportunities do schools typically have for them? 
That's a really good question. I think it honestly uh, also depends on the district. So some districts have a lot of support roles that might not have not that might not require classroom experience, whereas a lot of ISDs might require classroom experience before going into some of the other support roles that exist in education. Um, but some of the roles that don't necessarily require teaching experience, like our mental health clinicians, um, not school counselors, but those kind of support staff or social workers, those roles typically don't require teaching experience. Outside of a few years of experience, you can be a school counselor, you can be a dyslexia interventionist, you could also be an occupational therapist or a speech therapist, uh, providing services to kids in other ways. Um, so those are a few of those professions. Oh, okay, super helpful. Dr. Murillo, you're an expert when it comes to equity in education. Um, tell us what we should know about the work happening in this area of the field and why it's so important for both learners and educators. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I just want to say, Lauren and Amber, such great suggestions for getting into the field. The idea of job shadowing and also thinking about those other roles in schools besides, um, you know, teaching, um, great opportunities for those who might be interested. And those, as I think everyone on the call would agree, are super, super important people in schools, our paraprofessionals, our social workers, our occupational therapists, and we rely on them all the time uh, to make gains for our students. So thank you for those recommendations. In regards to educational equity, um, I would say the work in equity in the field just, you know, it just continues to grow. When I first started in education 20 years ago, it wasn't top of mind. There was research out there, but it wasn't in the mainstream um, of of, of the field of education and schools, et cetera. And now it's everywhere. And so much so that it's become almost like a buzzword uh, in, in some cases, but it is important work. So as you are delving into the field of education, um, you're going to hear about educational equity uh, and why it's important. And for me, uh, one of the reasons it's important is that our PK-12 population is now over 50% non-white student population and our teaching force is predominantly white. And so there continues to be this gap in understanding and understanding how to teach different uh, populations and what is missing in some communities and what communities bring to uh, the table as assets that we're not recognizing, et cetera. So the, the, the gaps persist, and so that work is definitely important, um, and it's important because we owe it to, to the youth of our country uh, to give them the best and most brightest future possible, and we do that by preparing teachers to teach all students uh, to recognize those gaps and the assets that all of our students bring to the classroom, uh, and then we work to give them the most equitable and brightest future possible, and we do that together. So uh, it's important work, um, and if you're in schools, uh, it's your work. Yes, you're doing amazing work, and thank you for doing so. We're going to get into skills and certifications next, but before we have a quick fire round question regarding career inspiration. Um, so I'd love to hear what other role in education you'd consider if you weren't doing what you're doing right now. Maybe it's a specific grade level, maybe it's something outside of the educator role. Um, Trayvon, let's start with you if you have an idea. Oh, yeah, definitely. So personally, I would be a school counselor right now, a school counselor, because Students have a lot of needs that right now aren't being met, like not even mentally, like they might need some help academically. Maybe a counselor can help guide them in the right path academically. And there are just so many things that are going on with students, like maybe they have a tough home life, maybe they have trauma, you know, you never know what's going on in a student's life. So counselors are definitely needed at all levels, elementary to high school, counselors are very much needed. Yeah, an important point of view. Um, Lauren, do you have an idea for this question? Yeah, and actually it's something I'm exploring currently. Um, I, I have a master's degree, but I'm considering going back for a second master's in administration and ed leadership. Um, I, I enjoy being on leadership teams at my school. I like making positive change. And so that's something that I personally would go for if I had to you know, switch out of my classroom position right now. Amazing, Amber? This is hard, but I think that I would um, I would be a dyslexia interventionist. October is uh, Dyslexia Awareness Month, and one in five of our students are impacted by dyslexia. So I really um, I have a passion around that. So I would love to work with kids in that way. Awesome, and Dr. Maria. 
Yeah, I agree with Amber. It's kind of a hard question. I've loved all the positions that I've had. Um, and so working at, you know, the administrative level and then in the classroom, I could see myself easily going to back to, to either of those. Uh, I would say one of the things that I've dreamed about, you know, is to be a school librarian because just sharing the love of books with students and uh, connecting them uh, to those words. Uh, and there's lots of great equity work to be done <laughs> and that's in that area as well. Uh, so that's something I think that, um, you know, for the lightning round, I'm going to be a school librarian. <laughs> Amazing. Always the best. All right. Getting into skills and certifications. Lauren, you just mentioned that you had one master's degree. What did the process look like for you to receive your current credentials and like why you decided to get that, et cetera? Um, yeah. So actually, when I was going to school for my bachelor's degree, um, the degree at the university I attended was a PK3 license. Um, and then I did the four or five endorsement on top of that. Um, it helps to make you more marketable to schools when you're trying to find a job. You know, back then there wasn't a teacher shortage, but, you know, times have changed. <laughs> so um, that's just something to, you know, add a little thing to your resume. Like, hey, I can teach two extra grade levels, all four content areas. And honestly, that helped me out a lot in my job. I got moved to a fifth grade classroom position um, mid-year because of that certification. Um, and then I, I went back for my master's degree in uh, reading and literacy. So I am the inclusion class. My school district is super tiny. We have literally 600 kids in the entire K-12 district. Um, yes, it's puny, <laughs> um, but it's, it's nice because like everyone knows everybody. And uh, so I have the inclusion class and I get to work with um, all kinds of readers and that's my specialty. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about going back for my um, administration degree and hopefully at some point, maybe take on a leadership role. So there's all kinds of different avenues that you could go down. Um, I even looked at doing like a curriculum and instruction degree at one point, and there's there's just so many options out there. And you really just need to do your research and look at your universities around you and what is offered. And there's even a lot of online, um, you know, universities from across the country. You can take classes from anywhere. So it's um, it's pretty wide open for credentials. That's so interesting. My high school graduating class was like 600. So that's, that's wild. Mine too. I got really? like almost 400. So like this school is really small. That's like, yeah, it's like a 180 experience. Um, Trayvon, are there any skills that you didn't learn in school, like within college or after that you've since needed to be a successful teacher that you would recommend to those listening, like definitely honing on those skills? Yeah. So one thing is definitely classroom management. You were taught that in college, but the thing is, classroom management is something that you truthfully don't learn until you experiment with it and you actually do it in a classroom yourself. Because, yeah, you can listen to a professor in lecture, but that doesn't always translate to good classroom management, you know, because students are unique individuals and sometimes you have to change things up with, up with certain students and some routines you learn in college might not work as best as other routines that you could find from someone else. So. Classroom management is definitely one thing that it actually is taught, but it's not truthfully taught. Hmm, okay. And then Amber, similar question there. What are some characteristics you think that make good educators today? I'm really glad the question was around characteristic and not like necessarily like hardcore skills. Cause like Trayvon said, you can teach and learn these things theoretically like classroom management, but it's totally different once you get inside the classroom and have to apply those skills. Um, but some of the characteristics are one being adaptable and flexible. Lauren just said she got moved in the middle of the year. So changes do happen in education and each year is different. So that's one of the things I always talk to teachers about, like no year is like the year before, no class is like the last class. So we really have to be flexible in our mindsets. And then also having a growth mindset, just always knowing that things change, you'll receive a lot of feedback in education, be it from your team members or from parents or from the administration. Uh, so being open to that, uh, being a self-starter is very important because there might not always be someone to be directly over you and um, pr prompting you to initiate this or initiate that. Um, and the last thing that I would say is also being proactive, being proactive in terms of how you seek information. If you didn't go to school to be an education major or if you did, that's still really needed because there's a lot of work to be done um, to prepare. 
Yeah, I hear that a lot from my educator friends of like that pivot of really getting comfortable with constructive criticism and feedback. So I love that you mentioned that. Dr. Murillo, a lot of branch ed's work focuses on preparing educators for the classroom. What sort of preparation do you think is most important for developing like highly effective teachers? Yeah, there's so much that goes into teacher pressure preparation, but I want to build on the on Trayvon's experience of learning about classroom management, but not really having maybe an opportunity to practice it until maybe he's in front of a classroom full time. And I think that is one of the keys to teacher preparation is to get uh, students or teacher candidates into classrooms early, not like, you know, letting them you know, full responsibility, but get them in early, let them practice those things that Trayvon heard about in his lecture about classroom management, let him see it in action, uh, let him see how teachers navigate when it doesn't go as, as planned, etc. Uh, I think um, that is a key to preparation. And then I think another key for preparation, uh, kind of building on that practice-based experience or seeing things in action is really building on partnerships um, teacher preparation needs to be done in the context of community and where those teachers, those coaches, those administrators will serve. The needs of school communities are different across the country. They're different in rural Georgia than they are in LA. It's a different community in Dubuque, Iowa, in a border town in Texas, New York City. All these communities are so different. And so you're going to need some of the same skill set, but you're also going to need some specialized school skill sets uh, in some of the in, in all of the communities based on, on those communities. And so, um, when we're doing good preparation of, of teachers, we're preparing them uh, with real life experience, hands on practice based experiences, and we're um, preparing them in the communities where they can serve, so they can see the different nuances and the needs of of those communities. Amazing. Thank you for that. I think a theme we're hearing a lot is, of course, it varies district to district, but I do want to talk a little bit about the recruitment process for those listening to get a feel for it. Trayvon, can you talk about your experience getting hired as a teacher? How did you find the places that were hiring? What was like your first moves there? And what did your application process look like? Yeah, so out of college, my college provided a little list. It was probably like a 15 mile radius of districts in the area, which, like I said, I'm from Los Angeles, so there are a lot of districts, charter schools, private schools, so you have a lot of options, but one thing I would say is you do want to do your research, like things like salary schedule, talk to different people, and if you've ever, like, job shadow, like Lauren said before, you know, different schools, see the vibe of the school, and kind of write down different schools that you might be interested in or districts you might be interested in. And as far as the application goes, it asks for the basic things like transcripts, photocopies of degree, credential, they might ask for references. So just have all those things on deck, but each dis district is different for what they ask for. Awesome, thank you. Lauren, how about you? Have you seen the process change at all for your peers over the recent years um, who are just entering the classroom? And what would you want someone who is just starting out to definitely know going in? Yeah, I think the process has changed just a little bit, but um, I still think that the districts are looking for high quality teachers. Like, even though there is a shortage, they don't want to short their students either. So making sure that you're setting yourself up to look like the best candidate that there is out there, being confident in yourself. Like um, Trayvon said, researching the school, have some background knowledge about the school before you walk into that interview. So if they're asking you, why do you want to be a part of this school community? You can answer that question. Um, and then one thing that worked for me and I think would be helpful for everybody else, um, as I was going through college, I kept my lesson plans that I wrote, I kept any activities I did through student teaching and through like my, like my preclinicals or anything like that in a binder. And then I literally brought that with me to my interviews that I had and I would show them like physical like evidence of things that I had done. I took pictures of things I did in the classroom during student teaching and things like that. So like districts will see that you're prepared and that you, you know, have a, a knack for this and that you're, you know, you're the best candidate that they want at their school. So um, really, I think it's about selling yourself and really making them know that, you know, I'm prepared for this job. I know what I'm doing and I am the one that you should hire. Awesome. 
Amber, as a principal, of course, you're doing a lot of hiring. From where you stand, what does the recruitment process look like for K through 12 educators? I think the process definitely varies from district to district. And now with us being in a teacher shortage, um, I think that some people have a, a more increased sense of urgency around hiring, of course. So we've kind of abbreviated processes. Um, so generally you might start with the phone screening, but also in education with the state of it is how it is right now, you might have an interview and get a offer immediately after, especially as we um, will work to fill positions. So depending on the time of the year, again, I know a lot of people will graduate in December. So uh, principals will be looking to fill vacancies then with the influx of college graduates. Um, but primarily interviews consist of um, traditional interview questions as well as role plays. I know Trayvon and Lauren spoke to both being education majors. So they did have some kind of background that they learned about in school. I was alternatively certified. So I would say to those who might have a different major, don't be afraid of not knowing how to answer those lesson planning questions, because we also have questions that drill down to mindsets. And are you coachable? Are you willing to learn? Have you done a little bit of research on your own? So you might not have to come with your lesson plan portfolio, but just know that there's still principals that are willing to hire you if you demonstrate that you at least kind of have an understanding of the education landscape and you're willing to work hard to um, be a great teacher for your students. Yeah, going back to those characteristics we were talking about at the beginning, coachable is definitely a huge one. Um, Dr. Murillo, you've had a breadth of experience in being recruited for different roles within education. What do you think are some key pieces of advice here? I would say uh, some key pieces for advice for young people interested about getting into a, a career is to really uh, seek out a community that you are looking to serve uh, and where you're going to feel like the match is a quality match for what you wanna do in education. I think for young people in particular, we're seeing what I would call like a youth quake in this country where young people are more and more becoming uh, the leaders of the movements in our country, whether it be social justice issues like climate, workplace, equal pay, racial justice, LGBTQ rights, et cetera. Uh, teaching is a social justice job. Um, find a community that you want to serve um, and make yourself known there in that community um, and find that good match. Uh, if you're interested in making a difference and contributing to a more equal and just society, then teaching should be on your list. It's one of those types of jobs. That's a great segue into our next topic, because, of course, if you're in a change making job, you're going to have some hardships throughout, too. So our next topic is challenges. All careers have challenges. So getting into some real talk here, Trayvon, you recently went viral on TikTok discussing some of the challenges that male educators specifically face when working with young kids. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? I'm sure everyone's video. Um, on this call had not initially seen that video. Are there, and are there any other challenges you think are holding back educators from being the best they can be? Yeah, so a little bit of background. What had happened that day was there was a little girl that was on the monkey bars and she expected me to help her, right? And she was just hanging there and she wanted me to hold on to her as she went across and I just wouldn't do it. The reason being is because I kind of had this fear in the back of my mind that, you know, what if a parent pulls up? What if they report me, say, oh, he was touching that little girl inappropriately. And I just don't want to get that call from my district office about, oh, we have an allegation. You were touching this girl this type of way. And I know her shoulders were hurting because I had just left her there until the female teacher came to get her. But yeah, one of the things that does keep male educators, I think, from coming into teaching is the fact that especially elementary, the fact that, you know, sometimes people are a little bit more cautious when it comes to men, which I can understand the caution, especially if you're a parent, you know, you want to protect your child and you probably want to protect other children. You don't want to take any chances. But yeah, that fear is in the back of my mind. And I do think about it quite a bit because of that. So I'm always careful where I am. Like I never am alone with the student. My door is always open. I don't touch them in any way, like helping them on monkey bars. If they hug me, I turn to the side. So that is one of the challenges that male educators especially have to face. Thank you for sharing that. And do you, are there any other challenges that come to mind? I wanna make sure I also give you that time. Yes, there are quite a few challenges. Like 
you know, sometimes you want to be careful, like how you communicate with students. Sometimes the communication is it could be taken the wrong way. Like, you know, I do social media and, you know, it's, it can be difficult how parents see you, especially on social media. Like, oh, is he following students back? Is he messaging students inappropriately? Because I've seen it happen before. So I understand why some parents would be suspicious of it. So yeah, that's one thing that I have thought about because I do TikTok, but um, I don't really worry too much about it. You know, I don't follow students back. I don't comment on students stuff. I don't know what any student has going on anyway. So I feel like I keep myself pretty safe. Yeah, that's definitely a big uh, subject to bring up today. Lauren, have you ever faced a really difficult circumstance in your teaching career and how did you resolve it and what did it teach you? And also, you know, similarly, different challenges that come to mind if you want to share those. Yeah, um, so I mean, I'm just going to be blatant and honest. Um, the, the first district I started in just wasn't my fit. Like I, I was jumping to get into a job. I was desperate. Like I just was like, I need to have a full time job right now. And I you know, went for the first district that hired me. I didn't do my research <laughs> and I wasn't happy where I was at. I was not going to work with a smile on my face. I like had anxiety going to that building every day. And like, I just didn't feel like education was for me. And it actually made me um, consider quitting education altogether. And um, I, I taught there for three years. And then after the third year, I was going to quit and actually join the military. <laughs> um, and then I got hired at my school that I'm at now. I, I thought, I'll just give it one more chance. Like, if this place doesn't work out, then maybe this isn't the career for me. And it's amazing what the environment in a district feels like, like from place to place. Because like my school I'm at now and the school I used to teach at are 30 minutes away from each other, but they are night and day different. Like, and I'm not just talking like, you know, the, the community, I'm talking like administration and other teaching staff and like just different circumstances altogether. Um, so that was a really challenging time for me where I was, you know, considering leaving education, but I'm, I'm really glad that I didn't lose hope and that I gave it a second chance in somewhere, somewhere else that was a better fit for me and my personality. Um, so that, that can be challenging, just finding a, a good, good fit environment wise. Um, and then obviously I, I mentioned it earlier, getting moved in the middle of the year was a huge challenge. I had, um, we had really small class sizes that year. They collapsed my room in second grade. My kids got split among the other three rooms. And then I got shipped over to fifth grade. I had two days to pack up all of my stuff move it down the hallway, unpack everything. And then all of a sudden jump into February teaching this class of fifth grade. Like it was, you know, my class all year long. So that was a huge challenge. Um, and I, I mean, I obviously overcame that, but that was, it was a rough time and you're going to go through those times. But um, ultimately I can't see myself doing anything else with my life. Um, there are going to be really rough days, even at the school I'm at now. I have rough days. Everybody does. Everyone in education has a rough day. And sometimes you just need to like take a deep breath. You go home, you don't think about school that night, and then you come back tomorrow with a fresh face and with a fresh smile and ready to make it a new day. And it, and it gets better. <laughs> it does. It takes some time, but it gets better. No, that was all so great. Like, yeah, just like not making rash, rash decisions, like the foundation was strong in terms of your love for education, but that your environment can change everything. So definitely test out different environments if that is a situation any of you end up getting in. Um, Amber, talking to the ed, uh, educator shortage, would love to hear your perspective about what challenges the shortage brings on a day-to-day -day level in your role overseeing all this. Yes, um, I start my days pretty early in the morning. So I'm already wake up, roll over, look at my phone. I'm like, who's, who texts me? Who's going to be out today? Um, I think after the pandemic, we just saw more fatigue around, around a lot of people. Um, and we've also just normalized kind of as a country, like people need that time to decompress. And sometimes you do need to take a day in education, but it definitely impacts your colleagues when it's not prepared. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that might look like finding someone else to cover a class. That might look like splitting a class. That might look like me going in a class to cover it um, for a short time. So it really just depends, but um, it definitely impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. You're a rock star. Dr. Mario, any other challenges that you want to bring to light for people to know about? 
I would say um, no. I mean, the the field of education has had a rough go of it in the last few years. It's with the the pandemic and then the shortage, and you know, there's been a lot of heavy weight on on teachers uh, to perform and to tend to children who have been through a traumatic experience, while we as well are going through traumatic experiences in our own lives, uh, and so. I don't want to add more challenges to that, but I want to shout out everyone who is working in schools now and say um, thank you for, for all of your service and for continuing. I have a suggestion because I do see a lot of narrative out there um, on social media, TikTok, you know, about teachers leaving the field and they're like, you know, we're leaving, I'm done, here I am. It's, you know, there's a lot of, of that there on social media. And so I challenged some educator friends recently that I know that there are feelings like that out there that we still need to highlight the great things that are happening in schools uh, and the benefits and, and the, um, the satisfaction uh, that comes with a job that tends to children on, on a daily basis and gets to see them grow uh, through life uh, and make their uh, future a brighter future. And so there are lots of challenges and I would never be one to like brush them off. Uh, but I do think um, that we need to start thinking about a new narrative about what it looks like uh, to stay in education and to um, ride those waves uh, in in a positive way. Yeah, again, nothing nothing good is going to come easy. This is a very impactful job and there's going to be challenges. There's challenges in every career, but we just wanted to be real about those. Okay, last quick question before we get into audience Q&A. Any misconceptions or myths, Dr. Maria, you just basically went into one um, talking about social media myths about teaching that you'd like to take this opportunity to bust? Um, anyone can go and then we'll get into audience Q&A later. I'll go. Um, so one myth that I always get because I'm seen on social media as like, you know, I have this fun classroom and I'm the fun teacher and like, I get that, but then people are like, oh, you're strict. Like, yeah. Oh, you're rigorous. Yeah. Like you can be the fun teacher, but also have high expectations for your students. So I think that that's an important myth that we need to bust <laughs> that you can't be fun and strict at the same time. Amazing. Um, that is such that, a great yeah. one, Lauren. I love yeah. that because it, it's such a that's it's such a great uh, myth to bust. Uh, because we need to be both of those things. We need to be fun in our classroom. Who wants to have a not fun teacher? But we also have to keep those standards of rigor and you know keeping things in order and running a a great classroom. I would say I have two. Just kind of reflecting um, if we're going to break out the myths. Um, I find working with new teachers. Uh, that they're a little bit disillusioned because we have a Hollywood vision of what its teacher is, that you're going to go in every day and every day you're going to be inspirational and, you know, inspire students and, and save them from the disasters. We have the savior kind of mentality sometimes with our, uh, you know, in Hollywood and things like that. Um, and I'm not saying you will not be inspirational to your students, you will, uh, but like Trayvon mentioned at the beginning, he remembers his fifth grade teacher, I'm not, I'm not, maybe I'm remembering the, the grade wrong, but him coming in every day and ins inspiring him and, and things like that. It's a daily thing that you're doing and not every student is going to come up to you. There's not going to be a, you know, a Mrs. Mario parade every day or Mrs. Woolley parade that says you're doing such a great job, but you are doing a great job and you'll eventually students will come back to you and say, oh, I remember your class. You were, you know, so supportive and things like that. So um, that's a myth that every day you're going to kind of be inspiring, you know, having those great moments. And then the other one is the myth, especially again for new teachers that, uh, the myth of like the cranky, old, uninspiring veteran teacher, I would say, especially from a multicultural view, like let's lean into our elders in schools uh, who have this wealth of knowledge over time. Um, I often see new teachers kind of huddle together, um, you know, all the first, you know, first year teachers are eating lunch together every single day, um, and they're not really interacting as much. Uh, with veteran teachers who have so much uh, to offer uh, and a lot of knowledge that we can lean into. Both of those are really great points. Trayvon and Amber, I don't want to rush you, but we do have some like great uh, Q&A questions from the audience. But do you have anything else you want to add when it comes to myths about teaching? If not, good to move on then though. No? Okay, good. 
so now we're getting into, in the meantime, we're going to play some remarks from Secretary Cardona, Secretary of Education, about why he chose this life path. So if you have any questions, you have about two more minutes to get them in, and then we're going to jump into those. So I'm going to play that video now. Good evening. I'm Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona. Some of you might feel called to be a teacher. You've been drawn to the classroom from the start. You're ready. I feel that excitement. But if you're not there yet, that's okay. Back in the day when I was a high school student, I didn't know what I would want to do after graduation myself. It was when a teacher, Mrs. Ransom, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, Miguel, you should consider teaching, that I even started to consider it. She was right. Even though the decision to go into teaching wasn't one that I thought of when I was young, it was the best thing I did. I remember back then saying I wanted to become an art teacher, but then as I got enrolled in the program, I started going toward elementary education. And let me tell you, I realized teaching isn't a job. It's an extension of your life's purpose. I feel fulfilled that I'm helping other people grow and making my community better. Honestly, there's nothing that I could have done that would make me feel more complete than helping children reach their potential. Because teachers don't just teach knowledge and skills. Teachers inspire, they build community, and they do change the world. In my classroom, we didn't only learn for the sake of learning, although that can be fun. We learned with a purpose. We learned to help make our community better, to protect our planet, to be healthier, to find the potential within each student, even if they didn't believe in themselves. As a teacher, my goal was to set up every student for success and engage families in this process. And as Secretary of Education, that hasn't changed. Instead of having 21 kids that I had in my fourth grade classroom, I have 50 million students. And the goal hasn't changed. Help them reach their potential. Give them opportunities that uh, maybe their parents didn't have and give them an opportunity to have an impact on this world. In this administration and at the Department of Education, we are serious about investing in teachers. And that includes making sure that there's diversity in teaching. We want our teachers to be as beautifully diverse as our students. And we're creating ways to do that, like pathways from high school to college, or teacher residencies, apprenticeships, and grow your own programs. We know those work too. We also overhauled the public service loan forgiveness program, approving billions of dollars in debt relief for teachers and other public servants. And we're fortunate to have an educator as our first lady, advocating for teachers every single day in the White House. So for those of you considering leaving your legacy in the classroom and those of you already sold on the idea, thank you. When you make space for students to shine, you illuminate a bright future for all of us. I like how he speaks directly to purpose because it goes into one of our first audience questions. So like, of course, the purpose of education is super compelling. But this question is, how do you guys deal with social anxiety when teaching a class? I've always been terrified of just presenting a presentation. How do you guys learn how to deal and learn how to overcome things like that, which can make teaching like it's, a, it's another barrier to get over? So anyone here have specific advice on that? I think I remember giving my first class ever. <laughs> many years ago and my heart was like pounding you know because you are like in front of a crowd every day and I think um for me it was just practice um like doing it on a daily basis um and just feeling more and more comfortable with it I guess another recommendation would be to start with small groups like maybe see if you can do some tutoring so that you don't have kind of that um you know anxiety um speaking in front of, of crowds but it is a skill that you'll have lots of practice at the other thing that I would add to that is just that I don't know what age that they would like to work with but kids are some of the most kindest most forgiving people like non-judgmental you can do awful and they'll think it was an amazing lesson um so just knowing that kind of always helped me when I did have anxiety going in front of them 
Amazing. Okay, next question is, do you have any advice in terms of going into careers in education aside from teaching? We went into this a little bit earlier, but whether it's a guidance counselor, other support staff, various forms of ad advocacy, et cetera, um, any advice for those specific roles? Because we did definitely focus more on teaching throughout the conversation. I would say if you're interested in a support role or, or a role that's kind of adjacent to the classroom teacher role, definitely do your research because as I mentioned before, different districts offer different positions and some of them do require teaching as a prerequisite to the job. So uh, just making sure that that's something that you've considered as you're looking into those positions, but there definitely are roles available. Some might even be at a district level. So just kind of um, looking at the landscape of the different districts, whether it's on a campus, it's a campus-based position, or maybe it's a district-wide position. I think an interesting thing to do for those interested in something that's maybe non-teaching is to go to like a human resources website at a local school district and kind of see what's available. Um, you know. We don't often even know the jobs that are out there. There have been new jobs that have types of roles that have been created since I've been in the field. And so um, going there and kind of seeing what's on the list. And then also you're still going to have to know like the system and the culture of schools. Uh, and so um, I think the same applies whether you're a teacher or somewhere else uh, or, or doing another role get into schools and see what it's like and see uh, what those roles look like in, in within the context of, of school and, and, and teaching. This next question is kind of twofold. So if you guys have summers off fully, do you ever feel that there is a need to go into other jobs or other trainings? And if you are not free during the summer from things you have to do within school, what are you typically having to do during that time? Um, so for me, my summers have changed obviously over the past couple of years, but before I did social media and everything else, um, during the summer, my schools would take time to like the first three days of summer break, all of the teachers kind of collectively agreed that we were going to meet together. We were going to come up with our schedules for the next year, any kind of professional development we needed. We were going to do it right then and there. So we were like set up for success from day one of the next school year. Um, and then um, I would work, you know, at restaurants or whatever to just to earn extra money over the summer. Um, and then now that I do social media, um, I'm constantly traveling throughout the summer with like meeting with other educators and um, just meeting with new people around the country and um, going to other professional developments and things like that. So although we do have summers off, they're never truly off. And I've probably moved classrooms maybe five out of the seven years I've taught. So those that kind of takes up a chunk of the summer also. Yeah, everyone's social media here is there's so much more to learn there um, as well. Dr. Maria, this question is specifically for you. Someone was curious to know what policies and procedures you advocate for to combat structural inequities. Oh, great question. So, so many. Um, so let's talk um, teacher level. Um, and so to combat inequities, like in the classroom level, it would be advocating for uh, diverse materials that display a wide variety of experiences that your students can, can relate to. So that could be classroom libraries with um, you know, authors of color uh, and or stories that, that resonate with the cultural uh, and linguistic backgrounds of your students. Um, I would also advocate at the classroom level for rigorous instruction. Uh, there's a tendency at times in certain communities to say, you know, these students can't do this work. And so we're going to, you know, expect less from them and design instruction that is not as rigorous. Uh, and so that would be another advocacy uh, piece at the classroom level that as a teacher that uh, you could do. Uh, and then I guess a third one, like I said, there's so many, but a third one would be in the area of assessment and how we assess learning for students. Um, I think we need to advocate for um, diverse assessments and not just hold our students, um, not just measure our students by, for, for example, standardized testing scores. There's other ways to measure learning that are actually more authentic and are more indicative of what our students bring to the classroom and what they learn while they're in the classroom. So those are three areas that I would start with. 
Thank you for laying those out. And Trayvon Amber, I'm sorry if I cut either of your answers off earlier about the summers. If you, either of you want to add to that, I want to make sure I give you the time. Uh, well, I work through the summer mostly. I get like in my district, we get two weeks off as campus principals. So the summer is spent uh, preparing for the next school year. So it's hiring, making sure that the schedules are created, all of those things, and then just preparing for the teachers to come back, making sure the building, like if things need to get painted, putting those work orders in. So it's truly just rebuilding for the upcoming year. Awesome. And this question is, I think it's going to be our last Q&A question. Super important to for everyone to understand here. Many people have attempted to dissuade me from teaching because of the salary. What would your response be to that? Do you think the reward of changing student lo students' lives far outweighs the financial reward? I mean, if we're being realistic here, um, uh, yeah, it's not the highest paid salary in the universe. That's obviously a known thing. Um, like I said before, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And ultimately your happiness is more important than the amount of money that you're going to make. Cause you could probably do any other career and make maybe quadruple the amount of money you would teaching, but are you going to be truly happy? Are you going to be enjoying your life? And those kinds of are things that are more important to me. Um, but there are also ways to move in the realm of education so that you can, you know, potentially earn higher income. So it's not like classroom teaching is the only option and that you can't, you know, potentially earn the same amount of money as other career paths. And I would also say some districts are recognizing that and with the teacher shortage wanting to be more competitive, like I saw our district at signing bonuses this year and I was like, where was that when I was teaching? So they definitely are working to get more competitive depending on the area that also largely matters. If you live in a rural area, salaries are going to differ than if you live in a city. Um, the starting salary in my district is 62500 and that's about almost $30,000 higher from when I started. So they are becoming more progressive and um, beginning to earmark funds to increase teacher salary. Is it as high as um, other careers might offer? Probably not. But at the same time, that impact that you're able to make, I think it definitely outweighs. And the fact that we're working toward a, liv a livable wage for teachers and people are advocating for that, um, I think there's a space for having both. Thank you so much for all of that insight. And thank you everyone for all of the questions as well. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Before we close out today, I'd like to give each panelist the opportunity to add any closing remarks or advice that they really want to get out on the table for these listeners and also those who will be watching the video on YouTube later on. Um, Amber, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you have any th thoughts here first, if not, someone else can go, but yeah. I was like, she's not going to pick me first. Okay, um, I would just say, regardless of what age you might be interested in, there's so many opportunities in education and we need people who truly have a passion around coming into, coming into schools and working closely with kids. There are tons of leaders who are willing to help and support who are just looking for people who are eager um, to, get, to get in and roll their sleeves up. So co consider a career in education for sure. Um, Trayvon? Yeah, so... When you think about it, when you if you're interested in teaching, one thing I would say is if you have an opportunity to do so, go in different grade levels like observing or doing clinicals like elementary, middle school, high school, because in college I went into a high school class because I had just left from high school. So I was like, oh, I know how high schoolers are. I think I can handle it. I walked in that day, walked out and said, nope, not doing that. So I switched to middle school and elementary. So it's always good to go in different grade level classrooms to see what you would actually be interested in because just because you were just in high school does not mean you'll be able to handle it. I had to learn that the hard way. Yeah, I think I would have the, the social anxiety in front of high schoolers more than anyone else. But Dr. Maria, your thoughts? I would just quickly um, say, if you have a passion for school or for education, for schools, for young people, for social justice, for making an impact, uh, schools is the place to be. Awesome, and Lauren? Um, I would just say um, from the educator's perspective, be the teacher that you wanted when you were in school. 
And uh, that's kind of the mindset that I try to go into my classroom with every day. And, you know, it might not happen every single day, but, you know, I try to keep that in mind. And um, it's never too late to keep learning as an educator. I've even job shadowed my literacy coach and my principal because I was trying to decide what master's degree to get. So, you know, there's always opportunities for the job shadowing, even after you've started your career in education. But definitely, um, if you're if you're passionate about teaching and you want to make an impact, education is a great place to do it. All right, Lauren, Amber, Trayvon, Dr. Mario, thank you so much for being here and all of those listening. It was awesome to have so many of you here for such an important topic. If you didn't get your questions answered, you can follow at Join Handshake on Instagram, send them a DM, and I'm sure they'll get back to your questions. Um, and thank you everyone again and have a great rest of your week. Bye everyone.